you break the rules and become a hero, I do it and I become the enemy. That doesn't seem fair. Welcome to Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Airy. I want to talk about Wanda Maximoff, specifically how she was portrayed in Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness. In a little bit, I'm going to be joined with two of the best, Matt Singer and Adam Lance Garcia. Now, we've already made some videos praising this movie. I mean, the visuals, the action, the character arc for Strange, and that fun Raimi violence. But one part of the movie was very disappointing, the villain. Wanda Maximoff. I wasn't cool with this because it betrayed her arc in WandaVision and her motivations were pretty dumb and inconsistent. In other words, they did her dirty and I'm going to explain why. First, I gotta say, while I didn't like how the movie portrayed Wanda, Elizabeth Olsen was great. She's fantastic in this role and one of the best actors in the MCU. She brought it. Now, leading into the movie, it was surprising how they were able to keep the villain a secret. Now, from the trailers, you'd think they were going to be fighting like a monster or like an evil Steven and that maybe a Wanda heel turn would happen toward the end. But that heel turn happened in her very first scene, and she only gets more ruthless from there. The problem is, WandaVision did not leave this character in a place where she was ready to immediately turn evil. Well, I mean, they kind of did. <laughs> But I'll talk about that in just a second. Some fans have seized on this quote from Sam Raimi, where he admits that he hadn't seen all of WandaVision before making this movie. He only saw scenes that were key to her character. Yes, so he would not have been aware of Wanda's character arc. Yeah, but I don't think that's fair. As a director, Raimi wouldn't need to see every second of the show, just the parts that informed Elizabeth Olsen's acting in the movie. But screenwriter Michael Waldron, I'm sure, saw the show multiple times, which makes it even more baffling that Wanda's character arc from the show is so severely undercut by the movie. So let's talk about WandaVision. The show is structured around the five stages of grief. There are specific episodes that deal with denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. Creating the hex was a form of denial, as she lived in a 50s fantasy world. My husband and his indestructible head. <laughs> because frankly, the 50s sitcoms were all denying the world's social ills. Anger was when Wanda decided to expel Monica and how she threatened the sword agents. This will be your only Warning. Bargaining was the introduction of her brother Pietro just after she fought with Vision. Long lost bro get to squeeze his stinking sister to death or what? Like maybe she can't have her real brother and her perfect life with Vision, but she can have a fake brother and that'll be good enough. Depression is from the direct address episode. It's probably just a case of the Mondays. Am I right? <sighs> And acceptance is where she finally ends up, understanding that her fantasy is hurting others. We feel your pain. Your grief is poisoning us. And she has to learn to let go of Vision and her boys. Thanks for choosing me to be your mom. Or, as Vision put it, But what is grief, if not love persevering? Now that is just stellar writing. A mother having to sacrifice her kids for the good of others is the ultimate act of love, which makes it even more frustrating that in this movie, she is willing to sacrifice hundreds of lives to be with any version of her children. Now that last episode of WandaVision gets dumped on by fans, but I loved it. We got the big action scene, Wanda realizing her destiny as a witch, and then she does the right thing. This is the most complex emotional arc we've ever seen in the MCU. Over about, what, seven, eight hours, Wanda goes from being enveloped in her grief to being a stronger person who is able able to face reality. There are so many life lessons about grief in this show that are inspiring to people who are going through loss. And none of this character journey is presented in Multiverse of Madness. They took this nuanced character study and gave it the Game of Thrones Season 8 treatment. They say every time a Targaryen is born, the gods toss a coin. I worry about his state of mind. Tolvrio Pregelat! The dragon lady go bad because screenplay say so. And in this movie, which lady go bad because the screenplay say so? That's a keen observation, person. Ah, thanks, Doug. This job's great. Just a couple of guys getting to talk about Marvel movies all day. A lot of people are always asking me how they can do what I do. I mean, all of us love these movies, so who wouldn't want to make a living doing something you're passionate about? So if you're interested in making money by doing what you love, I got a book to recommend for you. It's called Turn Your Fandom Into Cash by Carol Pinchevsky, and it's the sponsor of this video. So let's say that you're like a really good artist and you want to make apparel featuring your favorite characters. This book shows you how you can make products that don't infringe on anyone's intellectual property. The book walks you through things like fair use, what it means, and most importantly, what is and isn't fair use. In other words, you can't put Spider-Man on a t-shirt, but 
You could put Tom Holland on a shirt that says, who is this, like this shirt from Epic Hero. Even better, Carol will show you how to register your own IP. The book is very simple to understand. It's laid out in a comic book-like style, and it offers all sorts of great advice on getting work in geeky businesses like video games or publishing. The book also covers how to fund a business, how to run a business, and how to promote your work. So if you want to get started doing what you love, I can't recommend this book highly enough. Click the link in the description and get your copy today. Back to Doctor Strange. And just to nitpick, before we get into the Multiverse of Madness, there's another glaring flaw to this movie. It assumed that everyone has a Disney Plus subscription and has seen WandaVision. If the last Marvel movie you saw was Endgame, you would have no idea how Wanda went from this... She knows. ...to this. <laughs> Steven, like, mentions the hex briefly, but there's no exposition at all. There should have been, I don't know, a 10-second news report or something. I mean, the MCU loves their news reports. What legal authority does an enhanced individual like Wanda Maximoff have? Like, a lot. Traditionally reclusive Wakandans were on an outreach mission in Lagos. Cell phone footage of a masked assailant fleeing the scene. Protesting the recent peace treaty signed by the Kree Emperor. Captain America saved my life. Let's recap some of the frightening developments. American airwaves were hijacked. The nation remains on high alert. But whatever, I guess from like Wanda's opening dream, you get the idea. Her goal was simple. I just want my kids back. And this goal was set up at the end of WandaVision. <laughs> So, we have to talk about that post credit scene of WandaVision because it did set up what we see in this movie. The Darkhold is this super duper evil book that Agatha owned, and presumably, it's how she learned to steal people's life energy and magic. So, Wanda using it at the end of the show is bad news. It's also a big shock to see her astral form studying so intently. It shows how far and how quickly she's progressing. It's almost like she's been split in two. There's the kind, caring Wanda making tea, covering up this facade of a Wanda ruthlessly pursuing power. Cool. That's all setting up a story where Wanda is at war with herself, and that tease. <laughs> Mom, please help. She hears her sons trapped somewhere calling out for help, kind of like in the comics when her boys are kidnapped and taken to hell. This is setting up that the specific spirits of the kids she created are calling out to her, or at least that's what Wanda thinks is happening. Now, obviously, this is the dark hold and its creator, Kathan, messing with her mind, trying to seduce her to the dark side. Did you ever hear the tragedy of Darth Plagueis the Wise? We're never told any of that though, but I guess we can infer it. Great, fine, this is setting up a pretty great premise. Our first MCU hero falling to the dark side. Now this post credit scene could have meant that her kids are real, their souls are in hell, or they're trapped out in the multiverse, or that the dark hold made her kids to begin with and they were never real, or even that there were other versions of her boys in the multiverse that actually need her help. Just about any version you can think of is better than what we saw in the movie. I think the problem is, this movie is about the multiverse, so the kids needed to be in the multiverse, so Wanda would go into the multiverse, and we need the movie to be about the multiverse because we're setting up a big cool multiverse crossover that's going to happen in a few years. So instead of Wanda like trying to save her kids or something, she wants to kidnap them. This sounds familiar. Yes, because it was the exact motivation of the Kingpin in Into the Spider-Verse. He wanted to find Vanessa in another reality and bring her to his reality. And the heroes even present to him with the same argument. <laughs> What you want, man? What? And characters in this movie make the same argument, that she's trying to take the kids away from a version of their mom, but she just keeps saying, my boys need their mother. So she goes on a murder spree that's second only to Thanos, decimates Carmartage, the Illuminati, and then tries to kill a teenager. And why? I just want my kids back. But that's not even true. She wants someone else's kids back. Now, I will say that a variation of this story did happen in the comics Avengers Disassembled, but it was much better done in the books. In that comic, Wanda has forgotten that her children ever existed. When she remembers, she flips out because her kids were imaginary and she loses her grip on reality. Because in the comics, Wanda's abilities are to manipulate reality. So she already had a tenuous grip on what was real and what was not. Think about it. I mean, her every whim can rewrite existence. So subconsciously, she starts to destroy the Avengers killing them off, and then she completely restarts reality. And all of that setup is in the MCU. It's your destiny to destroy the world. And I'm sure this will turn out to be Cathan's evil plan. I mean, he's a big evil demon who was banished from Earth. He's the source of chaos magic, the Scarlet Witch, all that. I'm sure that he was in her mind, manipulating her to do these things. The problem is that the movie never makes that clear. They make it sound as if Wanda is acting on her own free will. The other heroes try to reason with her instead of telling her to fight the influence of the Darkhold. Like, okay, when she realizes Wendigore Mountain is her throne, it seems like she's really digging the power. But then later, she's suddenly like, I don't want this throne, I just want my kids. 
It's very weird. Like, there were some scenes that were cut of her being pulled in different directions or something. Now, her last moments in the movie are effective. She sees herself through her kid's eyes and realizes that she has become a monster. But I don't really think the movie earned that moment because the movie never justified her goals. This is the key to any great villain. We have to sympathize with what they want. And this would have been such an easy fix. I mean, the problem is there's never a moment in the movie where Wanda's goals are sympathetic. From the beginning, her goal is kidnapping when it should have been saving. Her kids are trapped in the multiverse and she needs to find them. To find them, she needs America's powers and anyone who tries to stop her is threatening the lives of her children. This would have justified her moral slippery slope. But then gradually, she does more and more twisted things, sacrificing more people, endangering realities, causing incursions because of Cthon. Then, and just like in the movie, she could be shown her heinous actions and does right by destroying the Darkholds. Darkshold? Darkholds. The pieces were all there, but we just didn't get that connective tissue that made Wanda into a character and not a plot device. Instead, she was given an evil goal, and it's not clear she was ever acting on the behalf of an outside influence. I mean, that's borderline character assassination. But now let's bring in two of the best, Adam Lance Garcia and Matt Singer. Adam, what did you think of Wanda's arc in the movie? Oh, I think they did want a dirty. Um, I had a lot of issues. And my one of my biggest frustrations with this film has been like, and I think, let me first double back a bit. I think WandaVision started incredibly strong. Um, this expl exploration of grief and a marriage uh, by using these different genres of television. Um, I think it falls off the rails in a lot of ways when they introduce Agatha because it felt like they needed to have an antagonist when there was a lot more interesting narrative of Wanda being sort of like the antagonist and uh, even uh, Captain Marvel being the antagonist where like they're there to help her overcome her grief. Um, so to that point of like when WandaVision ends with, you know, this big energy battle for reasons, um, she has an antagonist for reasons, but like Wanda comes away, you know, learning about how to overcome her grief. And then we get into this movie where it feels like we just completely skipped over the entire finale of WandaVision. Um, not only does it portray Wanda as some a woman who is grieving uh, as something to be feared, it is a, a, a woman who is a mother who is something to be feared. And even then it's like, okay, you can explain like, oh, it's a dark hole that has possessed her, that takes away her agency. So I think that in almost every respect, they wanted to have Wanda be the villain of this story. Fine, that's okay if you want to have her be the villain of the story. But everything that happens in this film sort of cancels out everything that happened in WandaVision, even though it's building upon everything that happened in WandaVision. Um, and then on top of that, the way she is portrayed, it really, again, it doesn't portray a, a female character, a female protagonist in a really good light. I will say what this film did more than anything is highlight where the sort of myth, the myth of the Marvel has a plan kind of falls apart. Because if the plan was always for Wanda to become the villain of the multiverse of madness, then WandaVision should have ended in a completely different place. Because yes, we see her using the Darkhold, but what she hears at the end of the post credit sequence, and correct me if I'm wrong, is... And so that's where we end WandaVision. And then we jump to Multiverse of Madness and everything's canceled out because they wanted her to be the villain of this film. And that kind of keeps on happening. I feel like, you know, the Marvel has a really good track record of kind of retconning themselves. They, uh, I mean, look, they did it with Shang-Chi. They even did it in WandaVision where they retcon her to be the, the Scarlet Witch. And they try to retcon Wanda into the villain of this film by saying, well, a dark hold possessed her. But again, that, you know, I, where that fails is that it takes away this character's agency. Um, and yeah, I had a lot of issues with, with the way Wanda was portrayed. And I'm, I'm, I might be rambling all over the place because I am kind of, I'm really upset. I'm really upset with the way that she was portrayed. Well, and you're right. And it's one thing that I haven't really thought about is she not only hears her sons in the dark hold, they say, mom, please help. And that's something that in this movie, 
they just made it where she wanted to be with them. So I think you're 100% right. That is a definite thing that was teased. And they keep bringing up, like, what about the other moms? Like, the, and she's just like, they need their mother. So it's pretty apparent. You know, there's little clues, like you see her fingers turn black, things like that. But I, I'm, I'm right there with you. I don't think that they did enough to show why she had changed. Matt, what do you think? Um, I agree that they should have done a better job of making it clear that the that the dark hold was, uh, you know, sort of more to blame here than just her simple grief over her children. I will say there's easy ways to kind of explain some of these things. Like if you want to, it's, you know, using, you know, it's uh, rewriting the story in your own mind. But like when she's hearing her sons at the end of WandaVision, that could be the dark hold is already, it's already telling her what she wants to hear or what it wants her to hear here essentially if this whole thing is just uh poisoning her brain then it's safe enough to assume that that wasn't her children doing that that was the dark hold kind of messing with her mind which whatever you can still say that's unsatisfying but i would have to imagine if you asked marvel this question like how come that happened at the end of wandavision and when we see her here like i feel like that would be the explanation they would give you i would prefer it if the movie sort of addressed it more I do want to say I thought Elizabeth Olsen was really good in this movie. I don't think she's written the best part. I thought she acted the hell out of it. I thought, you know, like those early scenes, especially where she's sort of putting on the facade of good Wanda and then lets that fall away and she's sort of playing the angry, uh, jealous, bitter Wanda. I thought were incredible, like yep. the acting of it. Uh, you can fault the writing of it, but I thought the acting of all that was really good and it reminded me like that Elizabeth Olsen is a really good actor. Maybe she's too good for this movie and for this part, perhaps. You could also argue that. But I just thought, you know, she made it um, compelling to watch this this character have this really um, kind of sad and depressing sort of descent into um, madness. I, to me, the biggest issue uh, that you have, that Adam didn't touch on at all, um, is the lack of yeah. vision in this. Uh, and I don't mean that like metaphorically. I mean that literally. Like the fact that vision is not in this movie at all. To me, like the more I thought about, thought about, thought about it, the more that seems yeah. like a huge problem to me. Because like the whole point of WandaVision wasn't any grief about her kids. The kids didn't even exist at that point. It was grief about vision. And um, so... To have this movie and have it all be about how she's so upset about her children, which I understand a, a mother or a woman who thinks she was a mother being upset about her missing children. I can under uh, I can understand that motivation, but it's like to have her never really mention Vision barely, to not have him come up, to not have the Vision who is alive in the MCU after WandaVision, to not have him at any point show up. To not have Doctor Strange go and get him and try to have him come and talk to this woman. And I don't know if the reason he's not in it is because they didn't want to pay Paul Bettany. Or if Paul Bettany was busy. Or maybe they realize that this story doesn't really work with Vision in it. Because if Vision shows up, I feel like Wanda doesn't go super evil. You know what I mean? And to have him in it is to acknowledge, yeah, your children who you made up aren't here, but... Here's Vision. You're not alone. You're not completely w without love and a family and all of this. And so it's like hard to tell this story with him in it. But the story doesn't make sense without him in a certain sense. So the more I thought about that, the more I felt like that was a really big hole in the story or issue with the story is that, you know, WandaVision was very much about Wanda, but Vision was such a huge part of it and her story and why she did all of this stuff that to not have him in this movie, to not really acknowledge him other than a line or two, to not have him in any of those other alternate realities where, uh, you know, like she goes to the, you know, steal these other kids and Wanda's there, but there's no mention of vision. There's no vision at all. What happened to him in that universe? It's just kind of a really big absence in the middle of this movie that That's I think a, is yeah. a big problem. Oh, sorry. I was gonna say, like, Matt brings up a really good point. Like, yeah, like, I, I, the lack of vision does seem really weird because, like, it would have been incredibly powerful if vision had been one of the Illuminati. And, like, what would that have been like? A, an alternate version of a vision where his Wanda had passed away or something to that effect. 
it, it, it's this weird conundrum that they kind of put themselves into because, again, they wanted her to become a villain. So the only way you can get her to become a villain is if it, he's not in it and being like, hey, you know, honey, stop. Um, but then, it, yeah, it, it's – but then you can't – but then the entire movie stops working. The movie doesn't happen when he shows up. Right. If we're talking about like the end of WandaVision and what they should have done, you know, your your point about doesn't seem like Marvel really had a plan. To me, the part of of that show where it seems like the plan falls apart, because I can excuse the stuff with the, the the last scene and the dark hold and all that. Like I'll I can buy into that. It's the part where the vision where Vision is alive at the end of that show, but doesn't show up here. Like if Vision was totally dead, I think that makes this whole transformation she undergoes, while it's still very extreme, it would make it a little more easy to believe it uh other than I, I, and you could say well maybe she doesn't i again it's i haven't watched wandavision in a year but maybe she doesn't know he's alive at the end of it um but again she's like the most powerful witch in the universe she could probably if she's looking around through the multiverse for her sons she could probably find out that a version of her husband is alive he has his memories back He's all white now, but that's okay. He's just a different color. And he's over here somewhere. Like, she, you know what I mean? Like, the, the more you think also, about like, it, the why more would you kind vision of vision go with it. find her? Sorry. Like, that's like, this vision is alive with her mem his memories. Why right. isn't he going to, to, to find her, knowing that she is, you know, in a really bad well, see, place? See, I, I disagree with both of you. I, I don't think the movie paid a price for its lack of vision. Um, we. Because at the end of WandaVision, they're very vague about how together he is. Because it's kind of like Mind Stone Vision, the one that Wanda created, has this ship of Theseus conversation. He kind of like barrages him with information and memories, and he's like, I gotta go figure this out. I am Vision. And he flies away. Now, I don't necessarily think Wanda would look at him and go, oh, there's my husband, the Vision, because she's dealt with a fake vision before this one that she created she and part of her arc in wandavision is my vision is gone you know that that's another guy maybe i can meet that guy get to know him and i think the same thing would have applied if other visions would have been in the multiverse now the movie does raise all these weird questions about wait how do these kids exist in every universe but this one did wanda is the hex permanent are they in the hex is vision even there is he visions kids are they synthesoids like they never really answer that but in a movie that I think, you know, it was a little crowded, I think introducing the vision into a scene would have undermined that character drama between, well, in this case, Wanda and Wanda. And you're right. I mean, if you would have brought vision in, it would have been like, you know, Luke Skywalker being in The Force Awakens. He just would have solved every problem naturally just by being the person with the deepest emotional connection to her. So I, I think the movie did, did right by not having him in there. There is one thing too, I always look at a movie and I, you know, we always look at like what's there, we judge it by what's there. There's one thing that's not in this movie that I think is a big uh, plus for it. And that is, you know, we're talking about Wanda and she's under the influence of the dark hole and she turns evil and all this stuff. But there's not a big third act battle with the demon that was influencing Wanda. And they could have easily done that. We just put out a video about uh, the ending of Shang-Chi and a bunch of Marvel movies, and how they try to cram these really big action climaxes into personal stories. So in Shang-Chi, you have this great relationship between the son and the father, and it's building up to this character drama, and then Demon Dragon comes in, and it's like everybody has to fight the Demon Dragon. They could have easily done that in this movie. Instead of making it a personal story about Strange learning to, you know, like every good teacher hand the pencil over to America Chavez, or about Wanda learning to accept that her kids are gone, they could have brought in a monster at the end, like, Wanda, I have, you've done my bidding now, and they all have to team up and fight Cthone, but they didn't do that. And I'm really glad that if that impulse was out there, they resisted it. I was just going to say, yeah, I, that was something that I absolutely thought about while I was watching it. And I really appreciated, too, is that they avoided that sort of uh, formulaic trap of ending it with, you know, it's not like she's trying to or even even having Wanda trying to destroy the multiverse. You know, it is really just Wanda wants her children and she wants America's powers and you know that's it that's the that's really what it all kind of boils down to at the end and if there's a monster in the movie it's the hero it's dr strange you know like you expect uh that zombie you know from the trailers you kind of we're waiting the whole movie for that zombie dr strange to be like the villain of the movie and it turns out he's the hero of the movie which i thought was again was a nice subversive choice 
that I totally did not expect at all and found um, very charming. So, yes, I would agree. That is a nice uh, deviation from the typical, there's a giant monster, there's an invasion, there's a blue energy beam in the sky. It was nice to have a, a Marvel movie that felt big but didn't end in, in any of those ways. Yeah, and I think to that point, like, I agree. Like, I think that was my, one of my favorite moments was like, okay, we're going to solve this by, like, a conversation. Though it does kind of bring up the question of, like, why was it this one scene that made Wanda realize how far she's, how, how far she's gone? Like, why is it this moment that she realizes, like, she's a monster? What, what ha didn't happen in the other circumstances when she's murdering people left and right? um that she doesn't realize that she's gone too far like why is it why is it this exact moment i get it because it's her kids and her other alternate self is there but it kind of feels like it, it felt like a beat that we were already hit like we've she's gone so far she's doing this like when she's dream walking in her other self and she's sort of like um like seeing her kids there like she doesn't realize that she's going too far um yeah it, I'm glad it like I'm glad it was a quieter moment. I'm glad it was a, a smaller moment, but it still feels like I don't know something just feels off about it in a way that I I can't accurately describe. Well, thanks for your thoughts on the movie. Love talking to you guys. Adam, where can the people find you? Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Adam Lance Garcia, basically anywhere at Adam Lance Garcia, and you can check out my sort of own multiverse superhero story, which is Green Llama Unbound. It's my first novel. Uh, many many years ago uh it's on amazon and moonstone books uh, basically from any fine bookseller and matt singer where can the people find you screencrush.com after you've watched all of ryan's millions of <laughs> multiverse of madness videos we've got lots more stuff there we've got articles we've got lists uh everything you can want to know about dr strange and other stuff and you can follow me on Twitter at Matt Singer. Well, thanks both of you for being here, but we want to hear from you guys down in the comments below, or you can at any of us on Twitter. And if it's your first time here at Screen Crush, be sure to subscribe and smash that bell. For Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Airy.